In this video, we will explore the wave phenomena of diffraction and interference in more detail. We will show how interference patterns are produced from single slit diffraction, and how to determine the angle of the first diffraction minimum. We will then explain how the single slit intensity pattern modulates the double slit interference pattern. Afterwards, we will discuss the interference patterns produced for multiple slits and diffraction gratings. Let's begin with the following setup. We have a laser that emits monochromatic light of wavelength lambda, represented by this set of blue plane wavefronts. These wavefronts pass through a single rectangular slit of width b, and we will observe the pattern produced by this on a screen that is at a distance much larger than the width of the slit. Instead of the light passing straight through the slit and showing a single bright band on the screen with the same size as the slit, we find that the light waves are diffracted by the slit. Diffraction is the process of waves changing direction without the waves being incident at a boundary between two different media. It causes the spreading out of a wave around corners and as they pass through gaps, which are commonly referred to as apertures or slits. Moreover, as the slit width B becomes comparable in length to the wavelength of the wave lambda, we find that the diffraction is greater and the wavefronts become more circular. Since the light waves are diffracted by the slit, we end up observing an interference pattern consisting of a central bright fringe bordered by alternating dark and bright fringes with decreasing intensity. We will now discuss the formation of the diffraction pattern from a single rectangular slit in more detail. When a wavefront emerges from the single slit, we can imagine dividing the slit into several narrow strips of equal width. Each strip then acts as a source of waves. These point sources are all on the same wavefront, so they are in phase or coherent, and therefore these waves can interfere. We then find that the intensity of light observed on the screen resembles the following graph. To understand why this pattern appears, let's consider a point P on the screen that appears as a point of destructive interference. Using the idea that the slit is composed of a series of individual point sources, we can see that each of the point sources will have a different path length to point P. It is these path length differences that will result in destructive interference at point P. It can be shown that when the path length difference from P to each side of the slit is equal to lambda, destructive interference occurs. This leads us to an equation that allows us to determine the angle to the first minimum for a given wavelength and slit width. The equation is theta equals lambda over b, where the small angle approximation has been used. If we take a closer look at the intensity graph and interference pattern from single slit diffraction, Notice how the intensity of the first maximum is considerably smaller than the intensity at the central maximum. It is about 5% of the height of intensity of the central maximum. In addition, the width of the central maximum is about twice the width of the other maxima. To calculate this width, notice how the equation we just introduced gives the angle to the first minimum in radians. This is half the width of the central maximum, so we have to multiply the angle theta by 2 to get the angular width of the central maximum. Furthermore, if the distance between the slit and the screen capital D is known, we can calculate a linear width for the central maximum. To do so, we can form a right angle triangle as follows, and using trigonometric arguments, we see that tan theta is equal to half the width of the central maximum divided by the distance between the slit and screen. These angles are typically very small, so we can use the small angle approximation tan theta equals theta which is the angle to the first minimum. So after rearrangement, the linear width, which is double the half width, can be calculated by taking the angular width 2 theta and multiplying it by the distance between the slit and screen. We will now apply this understanding to an example question. Light of wavelength 420 nanometers passes through a single slit of width 0.075 millimeters. And in part A, we need to calculate the angle at which the first minimum of the diffraction pattern is formed. To do this, 
we use this equation from the data booklet theta equals lambda over b. The wavelength lambda and slit width b need to be given in meters. So the values of 420 nanometers and 0.075 millimeters need to be converted into meters as follows. And so we get 5.6 times 10 to the negative 3 radians for the angle. Part B wants us to calculate the width of the central maximum. The angle we just calculated is very small, so we can use the small angle approximation to show that the angle theta is equal to half the width of the central maximum divided by the distance to the screen. Hence half the width is given by the angle theta multiplied by the distance 2.5 meters. This is only half the width. So the full width of the central maximum is this value of 0.014 meters multiplied by 2, giving a final value of 0.028 meters. The single slit diffraction pattern plays an important role in the interference effects for multiple slits. If we recall the setup used in Young's double slit interference experiment, the slits are separated by a distance little d and light of wavelength lambda is incident on the slits. Light diffracts at each slit, and the interference pattern is observed on the screen at a distance capital D away. When the effect of single slit diffraction is ignored, we found that the intensity of light observed on the screen from double slits resembles the following graph, and shows that the fringes are equally bright. We also determined that the spacing between fringes, S, is calculated from this equation in the data booklet. However, a double slit consists of two single slits, so each slit produces a diffraction pattern. This effect combines with the interference of waves from the two slits, so we can superpose the two effects onto each other as follows, and this actually modifies the observed intensity. The shape of the single slit diffraction pattern acts like an envelope of the interference pattern, and this is called modulation. This causes some bright fringes to have a reduced intensity, but the fringe spacing does not change. This modulation also results in some places, such as these two positions here, where bright fringes from the interference of waves coincide with a minimum of the single slit diffraction pattern. These bright fringes actually end up getting suppressed and appear missing in the overall pattern because of the modulation effect of single slit diffraction. When given an interference pattern such as this one, it is important to remember that it is the envelope that can be used to determine the width of the individual slits, and it is the spacing of the narrower fringes that can be used to find the separation of the slits. We will now obtain a more generalized equation which can be used for determining where constructive interference occurs for any number of slits. This diagram shows parallel rays emerging from adjacent slits that are at an angle theta to the center line of the slits. When we form a right angle triangle with the given lengths, the path difference between these rays to a point on the distant screen will be this length here, d sine theta, from trigonometric arguments. Now recall that constructive interference occurs when the path difference is equal to a whole number of wavelengths. Equating the path difference to a whole number of wavelengths leads to the following equation from the data booklet, where n is an integer that represents the order of the maxima, lambda is the wavelength, d is the distance between adjacent slits, and theta is the angular separation between maxima. This equation gives the angles at which the interference of light from two or more slits with separation small d will produce intensity maxima. N is the basis of the equation for the fringe spacing in Young's double slit experiment. We will now show some intensity graphs for 3, 6 and 10 equally spaced narrow slits. We can observe that as the number of slits increases, the intensity of the primary maxima increases. Notice how the width of these maxima also decreases, but their positions and spacing remain the same, so they become sharper and more easily identifiable. We also have small secondary maxima that appear in between the primary maxima, and the number of these secondary maxima increases with the number of slits. In addition, 
notice that we still have an envelope from single slit diffraction, which modulates the interference pattern in all of these graphs. And this is still determined by the width of the slits. The most common application of multiple slit interference is in diffraction gratings. A diffraction grating consists of a very large number of thin parallel slits that are very close together, typically around 600 slits per millimeter. This will be referred to as 600 lines per millimeter. The intensity graph for a typical diffraction grating would resemble the following graph. As before, the angles at which interference maxima occur in the diffraction grating can be determined using this equation. The maxima are much more intense than in the multiple slit situation we showed previously, and also notice how the primary maxima are all effectively the same height. This is because the slits are so narrow that the central maximum of the single slit pattern is very wide, and effectively doesn't modulate the pattern. White light that passes through a diffraction grating will split into its component colours, and diffraction gratings can also be used to identify specific wavelengths of light, for example in analysing emission spectra to identify elements. We will now provide a final summary of the key understandings from this video. We showed that light passing through a narrow single slit of width b produces a diffraction pattern with the following intensity variation with angle. Moreover, we can calculate the angle theta for the first minimum in a single slit diffraction pattern using the following equation. This effect is important as the shape of the single slit diffraction pattern modulates the intensity of the interference pattern produced from double slit and multiple slit interference causing some peaks to be missing from the overall pattern. Finally, we saw that having light pass through more slits causes the peaks to become more intense and narrow, and this effect is used in diffraction gratings. The angles at which interference maxima occur in multiple slit interference can be determined using the following equation. This now concludes our video on single slit diffraction and multiple slit interference. Thank you for watching.